Um, so we will be able to circulate this afterwards, um, especially if there's anyone who isn't able to join, we should be able to, to get this out um, as we did have quite a few people register today. Um, so let's dive in. This is an important topic, um, obviously for WIM um, as a network for females in the mining industry, diversity and inclusion is an important topic for us and something that um, is very near and dear to our heart. So we're excited to have a fantastic group of panelists here to talk about how their organizations are addressing some of the diversity and inclusion challenges in the industry. So to kick us off, um, I'm going to ask each of our panelists to provide a brief introduction um, and also share a little bit about their role and their organization. So Stephanie, because you're to the left of, of me on my screen, why don't you uh, kick us off and then we can go to Angie and then Aaron. Great, thank you, Catherine. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, my name is Stephanie Brower. I am the head of human resources for Orica's North America region. For those of you who are not familiar with Orica, we are actually a, um, solutions provider to the mining industry. We provide technology and services um, to the mining industry across the globe. We have approximately 14,000 employees um, in our various regions around the world. And I'm very excited to share a little bit with our very um, young journey into the DNI space with the company. Awesome. Thanks, Stephanie. Angie, why don't you provide your introduction? I'm Angie De Stefano. I'm part of the human resource team at King Ross Gold. Uh, my role is a senior manager of diversity, equity, and inclusion and employee engagement. We are a Canadian gold company with operation in the US, South America, Brazil, and Chile, and Mauritania. We have around 6,000 employees, and it's a pleasure to be here and share a little more of the work we are doing. Thank you, Angie. And Erin, over to you. Hi, everybody. I am Erin Patterson. I am the Director of Minerals and Metals with Osinko. Osinko is an international consulting company uh, engaged in the mining space, and we've got offices in over 15 different countries, and we are involved in the mining um, almost from beginning to end. Fantastic. Thank you, all three of you, for joining today and, and for sharing your insights. To kick us off, um, I'm sure it won't surprise many by me saying that traditionally the mining industry has lagged behind on diversity and inclusion. Um, I was reading, reading a recent research paper that was showing that in 2022, just 22% of directors at mining companies were women, um, which falls below the average for publicly traded organizations. Um, and that's Canadian data. Um, so although this data is kind of trending in the right direction, there's still a lot of work that we need to do. Um, so we'd love to hear from each of you a bit about how you're tackling female representation at your organization. And maybe I'll start with Erin this time and we'll go in the reverse order. Absolutely. Thank you, Catherine. Um, so this is obviously a subject that's pretty near and dear to my heart um, as being part of a group that's underrepresented in this industry. And for me personally, and for um, the USA branch of Asinco, um, you know, we're at the forefront of that. And so it's I actually just went to a career fair yesterday, which was a fantastic experience. And I was really trying to make sure that when I was speaking with, you know, the graduates um, that are looking for either internships or also they're going to be new grads, I was highlighting with them what we have within the organization um, and, you know, uh, highlighting that, you know, our mentoring ship program, what we're trying to do to engage with diversity, um, minorities, and a long term plan around that within our, our organization. And then that also trickles through not only to when we're trying to get the new uh, people into our company, but also our long term employees and how do we retain them. And it's again, giving them also that. Uh, mentorship, uh, safe space is a huge one. Um, and that's also been a bit of a challenge in that, you know, we try to do um, programs or um, have guest speakers and how do we ensure that we're giving the um, folks that are underrepresented that safe space without also excluding the 
the the group that isn't the the minority as well. So that's been a real challenge, and we're still trying to figure it out. Yeah, thanks, Erin. And there's a question in the chat that says, "Can you elaborate on the mentorship program?" So can you give us a little bit of detail on just how you've designed that and how it's working right now? Yep. Absolutely. So um, it's still relatively junior within um, the women within mining within Osinko. But what we're doing is we've opened it up to the organization. We are, because it's limited in the number of mentors we have available, we have had to limit the number of participants. Um, so we've gone ahead, we've asked for people to submit their interest into it. And then we go through and we try to match them within that mentorship program. Um, I don't yet have solid feedback on how it's going, but I know there's just, when we first announced it, there was a ton of interest. And um, it's, I think, not only within minorities, but it's also just a challenge because of, um, I think what we've seen around, you know, a lot of movement within at least the organist company and then the industry within the last couple of years. And so um, it's been really good because it allows new folks to the organization to get partnered with the more senior leadership. Okay, that's great. And is this um, mentorship program focused solely kind of on pairing female leaders with more junior um, females or is it kind of mix like what's the, the I guess archetype of kind of the leadership that's involved and in, or the mentor that's involved versus the the mentees yep so right now this one specifically is geared towards women um, or folks who identify as women and I know that you know there's lots of discussions on how does that get opened up to a larger audience uh, but because it is junior to us what we're trying to do we're just trying to keep it focused and not bite off too much to chew at the first. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thanks, Erin. We appreciate it. Andy, yeah. why don't you share a little bit about how you guys at, at, at Kim Ross are are addressing kind of the, the gap in female representation at your organization? Yeah, one of the points we have is like um, diversity, equity, and inclusion is part of our uh, four-point plan. Um, that is the performance measurement we have globally uh, across the organization. And that help us to have that multiple ways to approach uh, gender diversity across the organization. You will see like a few of the global programs we have, like a Women at Kinros, which is a program of eight month program around coaching, um, learning and development of females internally in the company. We have a third cohort working. And, and it's an amazing program that we start globally to connect all the females worldwide. Uh, and give to them some learning and development opportunities. But also each of the sites are working on that. Um, you will see Tasia's improving the recruiting targets around technical roles, uh, providing them training, adding them in the succession plan. Brazil, for example, have a specific program uh, for operators, female operators, where they train them and they give to them the chance to work in the, in the mining path. Same uh, you will see in Chile uh, with right trackers and training them with female roles doing that. And US is working with an internal mentorship program that we designed together with corporate that give to us, you know, that type of flexibility to adjust according with the needs of each community, but also be aware we have a few global comp uh, programs that can support that challenge and also create the space around retention development of the females we have already. Okay, fantastic. So it sounds like you're working across, not just at the leadership level, but kind of all, all areas. Yeah. So new folks into the organization and then also specialize more in job function too. Yeah. Okay, yeah, we fantastic. have like a multiple approach on that. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Stephanie, why don't you share a little bit about how you guys are addressing the challenge? Yeah, similar to, to Angie, you know, I think um, Oric has done a really great job at our senior leader levels, um, not only across our executive team in Australia, but also regionally within our, our 
leadership team here within North America. Um, we have about 50% representation on our leadership team um, within North America, which we are very excited about. But I think we all also know that we've got to continue to bring in that talent into the organization from a female representation perspective. So something um, and similar to Aaron talked a little bit about, you know, it's kind of career fair, college recruiting, a uh, heavy activity period right now for our um, operations in the, the U.S. and Canada. Um, we, over the last several years, have been fo very focused on our graduate program, which is a two-year program uh, where we bring in, um, you know, engineers into the organization anywhere from probably five to 10 over the last um, several years, where we actually wrote, do a rotation. So they spend eight months, um, they do three rotations going in, you know, participating in different types of roles um, at different locations. Um, and over the last um, three years, we've had 100% representation um, females in our um, classes that we've hired. So we've really, you know, put our emphasis on our focus on, you know, bringing that talent into the organization, developing them from the ground up. Uh, we have some wonderful historical success stories with our grad programs where we have had um, our, our female grads come in, go through the program, graduate successfully from the program, and have moved into leadership roles very quickly. So we are very proud of the program and how successful it has been in the last couple of years. Okay, fantastic. And Stephanie, that kind of touches a little bit on some of the questions that are coming up in the chat, which are around well, I, and I actually hadn't heard this term before, but I really like it, the technical glass ceiling. So those who are in very like STEM oriented um, roles are finding that although they may see more representation in other areas of the organization, so maybe HR, legal, PR, you know, marketing, but in the technical areas, they're finding there still is a little bit of that uh, glass ceiling that they're hitting. So have you found, and, and maybe Stephanie will start, and if others, um, Angie or Aaron, you want to add to this, feel free. Um, but are are you looking at any programs that might actually help specifically within those STEM roles and, and getting, you know, not just into the organization, but also really focus on promotion and moving into a leadership role? Yeah, so what we've done specifically is within our rotations, um, you know, we are bringing in engineers, um, you know, some of them are, are more in the chemist science, more scientific technology realm, but we bring them in, we kind of do their first rotation where they're actually in a field type of environment. So they're getting that boots on the ground experience. And then we typically send them through more of a technical type role through one of our technology groups. And then we also actually rotate them through a functional area. So they could be through okay. supply chain, they could be through um, our marketing team, just to kind of help round them out. So they kind of touch a little bit of how all of the different pieces of the organization actually work together. And what we have found is that through those experiences, it helps the, the new grads kind of figure out what is it that they really kind of want to do, the path that they want to follow. Um, we've had some who have elected to go very technology, right? We have some that says that say, I just want to be out in the field, you know, working with the customers, mapping out blasts, doing that type of thing. And we've actually had some that have said, you know what, I don't know that I really want to be in the technical space. I'd kind of like to do something more in supply chain or one of these functional areas. Um, and then through that experience, you know, obviously through projects and getting different um, interactions, it's, it's gotten almost to the point where when they are coming out of the two-year program, we actually have different areas of the organization that are fighting over this talent mm -hmm. and want to bring them into their teams, which is a great problem for us to have. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they'll invite Angie and Aaron to comment as, as well. Um, maybe Angie, I'll start with you if you have a perspective on specifically those STEM roles in the organization and, you know, any any focus on promotion and retention as they get more senior into the organization as well. Yeah, similar than Stephanie, we are working on that way. I, I think we have like a two aspects of that one. One is providing internal role model of success in the STEM world, female uh, ones that can combine that needs uh, they are looking for, you know, like a people who can cross that glass ceiling and show them how is the path, resolve the questions they have. 
also some of the countries are working with specifically with the local community to encourage um, youth to apply to this career path. I think, you know, like one of the challenges we have is when they are grads, maybe we are coming late on that uh, aspect. We are working with high schools. We are working with youth in a way mm. we can encourage female uh, to choose that type of career path. And I think working internally with our leaders around gender bias, having that type of conversation, training them in reduce the bias during the interview process and do a more inclusive um, interview, um, have our job descriptions uh, in a gender inclusive language that help us to attract more females. But also I think the more important piece is like how they can connect each other internally in the organization and show them um, I would say some role models internally that can help them to see they are not alone. It's not you only in that team. Um, you have more people internally in the organization and that is the main objective of the Women at Kimbrough's program. Show them different career paths internally in the company, different type of stories and have some peers that can happen in your shift, in your team. You are the unique female, but across the organization, we have many um, similar stories and you have a, a more, I would say, open network you can reach in case you need help and support. And, and that is the type of space we would like to create, you know, like a, how we can develop them internally, but also how, how we can prepare future generations um, to be more attracted to the mining industry. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Angie. Erin, anything you wanted to add on that? Yeah, just um, so I am in a technical role. And so I, for me, it's important, you know, as an early recognition of, you know, what my position is as a role model to the ones that are either just starting or, you know, we're looking for retention. But then also I find thing that I have been is key is uh, actually asking and listening to what the people want to do in a technical role, right? And then finding out what it is that they want to do and then trying to make sure that we're giving them the opportunities and that space for them to be successful in what they're interested in um, and also exposure as well. So that's how we try to handle that within our office. Yeah, that's great, Erin. Thank you. And an experience I had was um, when I was working in consulting, we had what we called an accelerator program, which was specifically geared towards women who were reaching kind of middle management um, as well, which was an interesting kind of approach for the organization, because I think what it did is it was able to identify here are some you know strong females that we feel are in these various technical roles and then kind of put additional focus. And I think it helped from a retention perspective, because it also helped to network the female within the organization. So all of what you guys are working on kind of reminded me of, of that experience I had that I think was helpful in, in retaining um, females in, in what was a more dominated uh, male industry at the time. Um, so that's fantastic. I know we still have some questions on, on what we just talked about, but I'm going to shift us a little bit, um, because we were mostly focused on kind of female representation. And I think there is some nuance between uh, female representation, but then also diverse uh, individuals in the workforce. And so we'd love to hear uh, from all of you on how your organization is, is thinking about how to have more diverse representation, if it's similar programs or different, and, and how you've kind of changed for that, um, for that different group of individuals that we're trying to retain. And so maybe Angie, I'll start with you this time. I haven't started with you yet, <laughs> and then we can, we can go through the group. Okay. Um, you know, like, I think one, when we start this process of diversity, equity, and inclusion, that we are new, you know, like, I think the story we have running this is the last four years. Mm -hmm. The main topic for us was not only attract, be sure, like, we are creating the inclusive work environment we are looking for. And for that, um, we have, like, a, I would say, four pillars of work. One of them is more connected to create a strategy and policies. Um, be sure like uh, the type of policies we have internally can reflect that practices we are looking for. And together with that, build the awareness um, and create that skilling um, technical uh, point of view our leaders need, you know, like a training them why this is important, why we, did, uh, we need that. And also try to help the 
current employees, the diverse employees we have internally, mapping them, knowing where they are, um, be sure like that they have access to similar opportunities internally, work around the equity component uh, internally, and shape the culture. You know, like we need to create, move the culture, train them, include this language as a part of that. Um, and that was, I, I would say, the first two years challenge. For that, we build an internal council who is supporting us in a way we can have that approach globally, uh, reflecting that type of diversity that can be different in Canada, that um, South America or in Africa. And specifically here in Toronto, we make um, a bunch of changes around um, reduce the bias in the hiring process. Um, I think I mentioned before, like uh, have more inclusive language in the job posting, be sure uh, the type of approach we have on that one, training our hiring managers, how to have inclusive interviews, tracking and having um, indicators, internal indicators, how it looks like diversity in our company, and also track uh, the recruitment process to see where we have the problem. If the problem is the attraction of uh, diversity, if we are losing them during the interview process, if they are not accepting the offer, because I think you need that analysis first to have a, I would say, a proper approach and, and fix that and get a solution. Um, and also we made a better, I would say, um, outreach, you know, like a, we are having diverse partners now to make public our roles. Um, because again, we would like to be sure like uh, everyone knows about that programs. And for that, we are partnered with Black North Initiative, Skill for Change, Women in Mining Canada, International Women in Mining. We are trying to target that way in a way we improve the way we are doing this internally and externally um, and support that process. I will say that are the main components to attract more diverse people. I think you can attract, but also you need to have the structure internally to support that change. Absolutely. And maybe just before we, we jump to Stephanie and Aaron on this topic, there's a question on what have you done to prepare the organization before bringing in like DEI into the picture? And so given you guys are kind of newer on the journey and maybe Stephanie and Aaron can speak to this as well, but you know, was there a lot of kind of having those challenging discussions with leadership or what was kind of those pre-steps towards rolling out the DEI program for you, Angie? I think in our case, we're still building that one. You know, like a main point was train our senior leadership team. Um, was an internal need and also was an external one. You know, like a, it's clear for us that our stakeholders are looking at the mining companies behaving in another way, create this type of uh, work environment. Also internally, our employees were requesting that. And I think yeah. that two forces uh, help us to put this topic in the agenda. Uh, we made different type of things, a lot of training to the senior leadership team, we build an internal policy, uh, we cross this as a part of the 4PP plan we have internally, that that has a component in the compensation of our senior leaders. In a way, everyone has that piece of accountability to create that inclusive work environment. Um, and that was most part of our effort when we start with mm -hmm. that. Now, the last two years, we have the internal council who is supporting us to build a strategy around diversity, equity, and inclusion, bring different type of voices on the table that help us uh, to be sure we are having the right approach for our organization. And also that has sort of freedom with a framework to the sites, you know, like say, okay, the company is looking this, but you know better than you know, all of us what is happening in your site and the type of need you have. But also we are monitoring that one with the internal um, targets that monitoring like a turnover for the different diverse groups, analyzing the hiring process, um, seeing how it looks like the gender representation across the different functions. That help us also have this type of conversation with a little more of numbers uh, yeah. to be the case, um, present in front of them the need uh, to make a change. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Angie. That's great. And maybe, Stephanie, I'll go to you next. And if you want to share a little bit of any of that upfront effort before rolling out kind of the DE&I initiatives, and then also specifically how you've been focusing on diverse representation. Sure. Um, so as I mentioned um, in my introduction, we are very young in our DEI journey. Um, Orica's really gotten focused on this at the global level 
probably within the, 12, the last 12 to 18 months with developing kind of our global strategy and then um, kind of have passed it now to the regions to kind of say, okay, what do you want to do? Um, so what, how we have kind of started to get the organization ready for DEI is that we have actually, um, in June of this year, we brought together a DEI council across the four countries that represent North America. And it is a group of individuals who raised their hands and said, hey, I'm passionate about this DEI topic. I'd like to be involved. Um, and through the establishment in the last three to four months, uh, we brought in an outside facilitator to help us in kind of setting the baseline and the foundation with the members of the council. So we we're all speaking the same language. We were all kind of heading in the right direction. Um, being vulnerable. Um, the, the new terminology I have learned is brave space versus safe space, that we need to be brave on both fronts and lean mm -hmm. into conversations. Um, and I can tell you that um, we actually just met with our leadership team yesterday to talk about what the outcomes and the recommended actions from the council are for us going forward across our workforce. And our leadership team was 100% behind everything that we brought forward. Um, a lot of it is going to be getting the rest of the organization kind of leveled on what is DEI. It's not just the gender, right? It's not just the diversity that you can see when you look at someone. It's all the other pieces that come into play with diversity these days that are things you can't see. And I think that that's where we kind of need to start challenging ourselves is, you know, really kind of looking at DEI through a much broader lens than the gender and, and that that we can see. Um, so it's just a really exciting time for us and, and where we're going. We don't have all the answers. I wish I could answer some of these wonderful questions that are coming through, um, but it's it's definitely still very young of a journey for us here at Orica, but we're excited ab about where we're heading. Absolutely, thanks, Stephanie. And Erin, I'll, I'll pass it over to you to, to pile on. Yeah, absolutely. So one thing that Osinko did, and I thought this was fantastic. They did it maybe 12, 18 months ago was they had a mandatory bias training uh, for the in entire company, right? And uh, I don't know about you guys, but at least for me, sometimes when you get these mandatory trainings come through, you're like, oh man, what is this, right? <laughs> um, but we did it and it was really, uh, it was eye-opening, not only to me, but to a lot of my colleagues. And like I said, we did it for the entire organization. It wasn't just at a leadership level. And uh, like like what Stephanie said about brave space, it there were some really open and honest communications after we all had that training, and um, so I think that was like a great kind of um, framework. Uh, that we did as an organization. And then we're also, we've got focused, we've got an overall global DNI um, committee, but then we've also got um, below that some focused committees, you know, mining, LGBTQ. And so we are focusing also around um, training and leadership for DNI across those um, committees as well as a company. Fantastic. Thank you, Erin. Um, and I see a lot of these great comments in the chat. So thank you, everyone, for, for piling your questions. I'm going to try and pick up on a few of them. Um, and then we still have a few more questions we want to uh, pose to the panelists. So one comment, uh, I'm going to wrap two ideas kind of together. So one comment was around if the panelists could comment on um, the progress around tying executive compensation potentially to DE&I targets. And so I think that kind of brings up maybe a broader conversation around, and you know, I've even seen this in, in our own organization at UEC, from an investor standpoint, we have a lot of conversations with our investors around wanting to see 30% representation of females or 30% representation of diverse individuals on the board, but then also the conversation is now starting to be at the executive level. So could each of you speak a little bit to you know, where are you at on that journey around? Are you setting targets for for executive level or or you know get to going down to the VP level and things like that? And and how are those conversations starting to form um, for each of your organizations? 
So maybe Aaron, I'll, I'll throw it to you because we just ended with you. So we'll start with you. I'm and, like and then, the yeah. worst person because I don't actually know if Authinko <laughs> has it tied into um, metrics for the executive level for KPIs on that one. So okay, I'm no sorry, worries. Catherine, but I don't know the answer to no that one. No worries, no worries. <laughs> we'll toss it to either, uh, maybe Stephanie, I'll go to you and then, and then Angie and you can share um, what you know of what you guys are doing there. Yeah, so um, we have targets for our executive leadership team. So our um, executive committee that is based primarily out of Australia, as well as across our, our region president. So, um, and that is something that, you know, is part of our commitment to our shareholders, as far as making sure that we've got at least 30% representation um, to that level. Most of the regions have subsequently kind of taken that on for the next level down. So kind of our um, North or our leadership teams across each of the regions regions have those established. Um, we've not driven it down much further than that. Um, I, I, I don't believe that we've necessarily tied it um, to compensation at this particular point in time, but it's just more of our commitment and, and our value to give back to, you know, our shareholders across the globe. Absolutely. Thanks, Stephanie. Angie, anything to, to add? Mr. Yeah, I, I mentioned before, it's part of our four-point plan worldwide. It's our performance measure we have. Um, diversity, equity, and inclusion is one factor on that, together with the ESG strategy. It's public for our investors. It's internally communicated. Uh, that was a change for us, uh, because now that that is a piece of the performance of the organization. All our sites has a specific objectives around that um, and the type of need they need to support on that one. And together with that, we have training, we have like a recruiting targets and that will be depends on the situation of each of the sites. But for sure, it's part of the four point plans of the organization worldwide and that support us the work we are doing. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Angie. Um, one of our next questions is around some of the challenges in rolling out DEI, and this can be, you know, broadly speaking, not just focused on maybe female representation or diverse representation, but um, the full spectrum. And so, any of the challenges that that you've experienced, and I noticed in the chat, some folks were mentioning, you know, specifically at like middle management, you're getting to VP level, there still feels like a little bit of a barrier. So I know that that remains a challenge for many organizations. Um, you know, but you kind of have to focus across the board from, you know, early recruitment through to executive. So if you can speak to any of the challenges and how you're working through those, or, you know, this is a, a safe and transparent space. So if there, there are challenges and you still haven't figured out exactly how to address it, that's also okay. We can kind of share about that openly as well. Um, so maybe Angie, I'll, I'll start with you and then we can go to Stephanie and then Aaron. Yeah, that is a hard one. I think we're still having that issue that um, the commitment can looks different than the practices we have internally. At that change of policies, practices, and has a sort of same language cross organization around diversity, equity, and inclusion um, is one of the biggest one. Um, together with the image the industry has, you know, like that we're still having an industry who has and a stereotype around gender in general is a male dominated industry. Um, we have a reputation that physical demands in the industry are hard, and that can be less attractive to diverse um, groups and, uh, uh, and create that, I would say, uh, performance and development we are looking for our talent. And, and that component still being a challenge for us, more also the global approach, because sometimes. Um, we need to understand the dynamics happening in each of our sites locally in a way that the diversity, equity, and inclusion strategy can look like different depending where you are working for. Uh, and that is the challenge, no? how we can have the same language with different practices according to what is happening internally. I noticed a few of the comments in the chat talking about neurodiversity, that that is one of the programs we have in Chile and Brazil, and they are doing an amazing job on that. But sometimes in order of our side, that conversation is coming later. And, and I think our role incorporates like a showcase that best practices we have internally in the organization and encourage other teams to try few of the practices other sides have the chance to put in place. And again, it's build that language, move from gender 
to intersectionality that was on one of the components um understand that all of us we have different layers um and we bring that diversity to the table i think that these different type of components need to happen internally in the company um and that is the biggest challenge how we can elaborate on that one and ensure we can push um the whole organization to that change we are looking for yeah absolutely agree thank you Andy. Stephanie did you want to add yeah I mean I think that on the the journey for Orca it's really been about you know the, almost the three pillars you know we need to be able to attract and then we need to be able to retain and then we obviously need to work on development so I feel like we've tackled a attracting very well. I think we are still very much in the the mode of trying to figure out um, how we do better at the retention uh, once that those individuals are in the organization, as well as how do we make sure that we're developing them. Um, I think from a DEI perspective, um, you know, that we we've you know we've implemented mentorship programs specifically around our middle management. I mean we have mentorship programs for our grads, but you know we're trying to make sure that you know and this is across all genders. It's not just the females, but we're we're trying to make sure that we're getting that mentorship happening at all levels in the organization. Um, you know, and and I think the other thing that that we're challenged and and the thing that we're working very closely with our DEI council on right now is how do we educate the broader population on what DEI is and what it isn't? And to Angie's point, you know, where, where we are learning is that DEI is different in each of the countries in which we operate in. It means something differently. So how do we kind of come to a baseline foundation that we can talk about DEI across all of our countries um, that helps us in those pillars of attraction, retention, and development, um, but doesn't alienate an individual, other individuals who may not really understand the concept yet. So that's really where we're starting our push as an organization is how do we get everyone aligned from, mm -hmm. you know, our employees that are out in the field all the way up to our executive team. Absolutely. Thanks, Stephanie. Erin? I think Stephanie nailed on the head there around growth, like retention and growth, right? Um, and that's certainly been a challenge that we've seen within our company as well. And so, you know, around the retention, um, that one's important because <clears throat> especially from, I think, a uh, the women perspective, there's going to be, there's usually a lot of personal changes that can make it a struggle to be in this industry. And so sometimes we need to recognize that we're going to have to make accommodations for um, women in our technical roles that we would maybe not make for, um, for gentlemen, right? Um, and also around growth, we do have where we rank our talent and we try to develop uh, talent plans for them as well. So that way they don't stagnate and end up then it comes back then down to our retention problem, right? Because if they don't see that there's a future, um, then they're not going to want to stay around, right? And so it's we have to focus on how do we retain them and then also how we grow them. Absolutely. Um, so one question that kind of picks up a little bit on some of the earlier questions in the chat is around, you know, we often see, which, and I think there's, this is an important component is, you know, female leaders mentoring, um, like young female professionals in the workforce. Um, have any of your organizations thought about, um, you know, allyship or the role of men, for example, in supporting women as they grow through their careers and, and how have you started kind of integrating that either into trainings, maybe in those, um, you know, bias trainings or things like that, or, or more practically in, um, in programs itself? And I saw Erin kind of nodding her head a little bit, so I'll go to yeah, you first. <laughs> definitely, because I look at the trajectory of my career, and honestly, I'm probably where I'm at more because of the networking I ended up doing with uh male senior management as opposed to the female management, unfortunately, right? And so it's, yes, providing that mentorship, that exposure to women in the technical and higher roles, but then also ensuring that there's exposure to the greater pool of, you know, middle and senior executives for um, 
women or minorities. So that way they are not, uh, so that way they're getting the visibility as well is important. Yeah. And I think you picked up on a really key point, especially as you're getting to that middle management and senior management roles around the visibility. And especially when it is a more male dominated industry, many of the individuals that you know, potentially a female candidate or, or individual is going to be networking with is going to be male. So it's how do you create that visibility, that space for connecting and networking and that person being able to demonstrate here the skill sets that I have. Um, and I think, you know, we kind of go back to um, in some of those situations, you know, some males might be more um, often would speak more outwardly about their successes versus sometimes you need to create a bit more space for someone who's uh, a female or a diverse person to have that opportunity to talk about all the things that they're doing um, to those senior leaders. I think it's, it's a really good point, Erin. Um, Stephanie, anything? I saw you kind of nodding your head as well. Did you want to add anything onto that point? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, we have um, through our mentoring program, specifically with um, here within North America, we have very purposely done mentorships with differences in gender just to drive some of that. Um, and the other thing that we have found to be very successful is sometimes the mentors learn more from the mentees um, than they ever would have thought, right? So while it, you know, it is, you know, it needs to be both ways, right? It, and I think that I've had some, some conversations with um, some of our male leaders where, because of the dialogue that they've had with their female mentees and understanding, you know, just different challenges, things they hadn't thought of, you know, different perspectives of looking at it. It's been very educational for them as well. So I think that that is just one of those bonuses that comes from having a defined program like that. Absolutely. That's great. Um, one question that I saw kind of pop up a little bit was around, um, an area around work-life balance. And I think when you think about um, different, you know, females, for example, at different points in their career, maybe having young children, um, that can be challenging. And so I guess the question around, you know, does your companies think about how you can provide work-life balance? Maybe it's not just specific to one gender or one type of person, but also just kind of accommodating for flexibility, thinking about, you know, depending on where the person is in their career. So maybe I see Stephanie nodding. So I'll go to Stephanie first and then I'll see if anyone else wants to add as well. I need to quit nodding apparently. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's just, you know, all of this resonates. So it's always great to know that we're not the only organization that's, you know, tackling these, these types of issues. But, um, you know, I think from, you know, all of us have experienced in, a, in a, the post COVID world that I think companies are a lot more open to being flexible with schedules, um, you know, whether it be re remote, hybrid, wh whatever that looks like. And, and while I find that there is a lot of benefit to for individuals to come together in an office environment, I, I do think that companies are, are willing to, to consider that. Um, I think the other thing that we are very specifically looking at across North America is relative to our benefits programs um, and our, our benefits programs supporting those situations where you may not have a traditional um, family, you know, with a mom and a dad, you might have these differences across, um, you know, different choices that individuals have made. Maybe they've chosen to adopt later in life, whatever that looks like. So we are working very hard to make sure that a lot of our benefits programs in each country mm -hmm. match up with the changes that we're seeing in the family units um, in each of them. And I think that um, it has been challenging because it's a different way of thinking, um, especially for, for those of us in the, the U.S. where, you know, bonding leave or parental leave isn't necessarily something that has been historically widely provided by U.S. companies. Um, but I think it's challenging ourselves to look outside of that, that traditional box that we've always looked at. That's great. Thank you, Stephanie. Angie, was there anything you wanted to add? And then I'll, I'll go to Erin after. Uh, I 
I will start saying that, Stephanie, we have like a different type of benefits and programs um, that looks different if you are working in the corporate office, can be different as if you are working on the site. Mm -hmm. And we have site that may change is to accommodate um, females during pregnancy because we are working in altitude and that requests that, that component. In other places, we have like a childcare um, offering. We have like a briefing room for the females to keep that. We have extension of the maternity leave in the countries that we request that. Um, we have a mix of benefits, but I will add on that one. Inside of our diversity, equity, and inclusion portfolio, we have a well being component. And mental health is one of the topics we work internally more to train our supervisors and leaders to have this type of difficult conversation around burnout, stress, um, read and have uh, the chance to read the signs of when someone is in distress, how they can support them. Um, because it's a male dominated industry, sometimes having this type of conversation are harder. And, and for that, we made actions like Movember to have conversation and deeper trainings around suicide prevention. Um, we have an initiative called Take a Break. And every quarter, we have a 30 minute session worldwide to talking about uh, mental health and well being. And we have different mm. topics on that one. Can be um, how to deal with parenting when you are a new parent. Uh, how I can manage habits internally. How I can keep uh, healthy habits um, when I work in with shift. We try to incorporate different type of topics to normalize the conversation around well-being and mental health. Um, and for that, we try to create diversity, equity, and inclusion um, minutes during the safety mini uh, meetings in a way supervisors also can take the courage and include these type of topics internally in the safety meetings. Um, that for me is a key component. You know, like we need the policies to support the changes of life of our employees, but also we need to create that work environment that is safe talking that I'm not okay today, I need an extra support, um, and that is not something like uh, will be difficult for your career performance. You know, like uh, it's okay, don't be okay. Um, in Canada, we are part of the Know Myself uh, Today campaign. In the site, we are working with other initiatives, and that helped us um, to have deeper conversation around what the employees need and, and, and include that as a part of the diversity, equity, and inclusion component. Yeah, I really like that idea to take a break, like, and it's just like a time to be able to kind of talk about mental health and things like that. Yeah. So it's a great idea. Um, Erin, did you want to share a little bit about how you guys are tra tackling it? Yeah, just a little bit. So um, I certainly agree around, you know, having that flexibility for your employees, like, okay, maybe you've got a new employee who needs to go have a checkup for a pregnancy, or um, they need to go see their therapist once a month, right, and providing them with that flexibility. Um, and then also, you know, when we're in the interviewing process for hiring, and it's not just for like, say, new grads, um, although I feel like I get it more from them than say, middle or senior, but they're no longer just asking, well, what's our vacation and our pay, they're asking, what else are you as my employer going to be yeah. be doing for me, right, to protect my work-life balance and my mental health. Um, and so those are some, I think, some broader trends that at least I'm seeing when we're doing the hiring and interviewing process as well. <clears throat> Absolutely. I think that is very, that is the new uh, topic. And it's good. Employees should be asking those questions, right? Because mental health and well-being is, is such an important component of yeah. it. Um, so I'm going to ask one more question kind of off my list, and then we'll see if there's any last ones in the chat, and I see a few more rolling in now. Um, and this might be a tough one, um, but I'm curious around, you know, we talk a lot about the pay gap between, well, historically more often measured females in a similar role to males. I'm not sure if there's probably as much data on diverse individuals in a role compared to, you know, a straight white male, but curious, you know, if your companies are tackling this or, or what the roadmap might be if you're not yet tackling it. Maybe I'll, I'll start with Stephanie uh, and then I'll go to Angie and Aaron. Yeah, so so this is actually something that has been um, top of our list over the last couple of years. 
Um, you know, one of the things that we do is obviously we go through our standard um, annual merit cycle, um, like most organizations do. And we always make sure that we put on kind of that gender lens just to make sure that we're, we're not seeing anything that that doesn't look quite right. Um, the last two years, we've actually done a mid-cycle review um, very specifically around any gaps that are focused on looking at the jobs um, and looking across all of the individuals in those jobs to make sure that you know we're not seeing those gaps. And if we do see those gaps, that we're actually addressing them as we need to versus you know waiting for somebody to, to decide to leave the organization. And then we're like, oh, wait, let's see what we can do about your compensation. So we yeah. are being very proactive um, within you know, the company globally on those particular issues, which I think has been seen very favorably um, because not only do those analysis often show us where we might have a, a female to male gap, but sometimes it shows us where maybe we've got some challenges within our, our male population as well that also need to be looked at. Absolutely, thanks, Stephanie. Angie, would you like to add anything? Uh, saying that, Stephanie, uh, the gender pay gap analysis is something we made regularly with the compensation team. It's an information we share with our senior leaders at the moment of promotion and the moment of like uh, increased salaries and roundtables. All that pieces are similar in the succession plan. And sure, like uh, we have that gender representation is part of the conversation we have with the senior leaders. We're still having the challenges depending on the country, how that looks like. Um, also, according with the labor market on there. Uh, but that the, the good piece of that one is our compensation team has that include as a part of the conversation. And every time they need to do that analysis, they bring the information around gender uh, gaps um, mm -hmm. in the analysis of the compensation components. In, and that is helping us to reduce that gap. And you will notice like we have a really good situation in most part of our sites. And the other ones have a short part plan uh, to work on that one and create the level of improvement they need. Awesome. Thanks, Angie. Erin, anything you want to add? Yeah, definitely. So we do a biannual review of all of the wages in our office and we try to make sure that, okay, if, you know, if they're the same position, same level of expertise, are we ensuring that they're getting the same level of compensation? And then I also encourage anybody who asks me whether they're my reporter in not a direct report. It's like, if you, um, you know, if, they, if you're approached with a wage increase and you don't feel it's acceptable, you don't, you can ask for additional, right? I mean, yeah. the worst is that they're going to say no, uh, but nine times out of 10, whether whomever it is, they're usually, if it's within reason, they'll usually come back and accept it. So, um, and I find that I feel like that's more of a challenge for women in the industry to, to come back and ask. For that right and rather than just being willing to accept what is being offered to them from their employee absolutely um and there was two questions in the chat that i thought were really interesting because they kind of reflected on um biases that we probably all have around gender norms and kind of what's the role of a woman versus the role of a man and so uh there's one question around how are you guys addressing or, or maybe encouraging men to take mat you know pat leave i should say um, and kind of trying to change maybe the culture around that a little bit. And then another question is around um, when you're looking at candidates to hire and you see a gap in a resume because of a parental leave, you know, how are you, how are HR departments thinking about that? And are you trying to consider that, you know, not a deficiency, which maybe in the past it would have been, but, you know, a component of, you know, ultimately a life and a life path and, um, and kind of figuring out how you manage that from an HR perspective. Maybe Stephanie, I'll go to you first. Um, yeah, so I think from the perspective of encouraging um, others to take parental leave, yeah. um, and you know, I think again, I'll, 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 I know this is a Canadian group, but um, you know, I think Canada, you know, obviously mat leave and and uh, paternity leave is very statutorily driven, right? 
um, where in the U.S. It's, it's not been something that's that a lot of organizations historically have offered. Um, we recently in January of this year actually implemented bonding leave across all of our employees. So regardless of, of what their situation is, if they're adopting, if they're fostering, if they're, you know, having a child naturally, um, you know, we are offering that bonding leave to um, parents who aren't necessarily carrying the child. And that's in addition to our maternity leave policy for, you know, um, our moms out there. So I think that that has been extremely well received. I think we've had um, five or six individuals have, who have taken um, advantage of that program and have been very positive about it. So I think that that was a good thing for us um, specifically. Um, when it comes to recruiting, I agree. I think in the past, those gaps have been a lot more concerning to recruiters. Um, but I know our recruiting team, they may dig in and try to understand why somebody may have had a gap. But I, but it's not something that we would necessarily um, discount and candidate for just because they took time off, to, whether it's to have a child, whether it's to raise a family, if it's to care for a parent, whatever that circumstance may, may be. And I think that we're going to have to be more and more flexible with those gaps um, because I think more and more people are op more open to taking, you know, sabbaticals or time away from work or time in between jobs than they have ever in the past. Yeah, and I I like the framing around bonding leave, like it because it completely flips like the bias. It almost removes the biases away from it, and it just talks about like ultimately what the goal is bonding with the child. So love that idea in general. Um, and I know that we're kind of coming up at the end of the hour, um, and a lot of folks are are probably needing to rush to other other meetings. So maybe I'll just do a quick you know thirty second close for each of the panelists. If there's anything else um, you want to mention or highlight. Um, then we can, or maybe address the last question if, if there was something on your mind and then we can close out. So I'll, I'll start with Erin. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to say thank you for everybody joining. I think this has been a great discussion and I really appreciated and enjoyed listening to both Stephanie and Angie from a different perspective um, and what they're doing within the organization. I know I myself already have some ideas on things I wanna take back. Yeah, I can say I certainly learned a lot of good ideas coming out of this. Angie, anything? Same. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, it was a pleasure to see the questions we are having and how that one challenged us uh, to do more. Uh, but also we encourage all the audience and us uh, try to understand that create an inclusion work environment is something is responsibility of all of us. Um, we have a lot of work to do in the mining industry, but also create that type of behaviors we are looking for um, to create a space of belonging for all. Um, that also is a challenge uh, as an individual in the organization to create that space for others. Yeah, thank you for the invite. Thanks, Angie. That's great. And Stephanie? Yeah, again, thank you everyone, the participants, the panelists. I I know I've dragged, jotted down a couple notes that I'm going to take back um, myself. It's These types of opportunities are great just to learn what other people are doing and, and get some really challenging questions that, that kind of make you think. So um, I just encourage everyone to continue this dialogue. It's so very important and we're only going to make a difference if we're all in this together. Absolutely. And thank you so much, Stephanie, Angie, Aaron. Really appreciate your insight and your time today. I know I learned a lot and based off all the questions we were getting in the chat, I think everyone really enjoyed it. So thank you so much. And we will share the recording out once it's ready over the next couple of days. Um, and if we didn't answer specific questions, um, feel free to try and send us a note or I'm going to go through the chat afterwards and see if there's any additional ones that we can address. So thank you so much, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.